Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to FPNA Trends webinar. My name is Larissa Melnichuk, founder and CEO at FPNA Trends Group, and today I'm facilitating uh, the discussion. I'm facilitating this webinar. The subject is uh, the latest trends and developments in financial planning and analysis. Uh, the results of 2022 FPNA Trends surveys. Let me update you on um, the agenda. We are going to look at the key findings. Data-driven decision-making under uncertainty, it's uh, the subject example, some of the examples. Scenario modeling, modeling in disrupted environment. Then how technology is going to affect time spent by FPNA. There will be conclusions and recommendations, and there will be a Q&A session. By the way, uh, we are joined today by more than 600 uh, registrations from around the globe, actually 65 countries on uh, four continents. Welcome, everyone. Let us start. It's a good timing uh, for our international panel to join us. Uh, I would like to invite Thomas, Marat, and Pras to join us, please. Hello, hello everyone. Quick introductions, let us start. Pras, are you with us? Pras is here as well. So let us start from Thomas. Uh, Thomas uh, joined us from Netherlands. He's a member of our Amsterdam FPNA board. He's senior director in MIA GTM Finance at NetApp. And today, Thomas will share his insights on data-driven decision-making under the uncertainty. Thomas, welcome to the webinar. Good to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, the next panelist is uh, Marat Lamakov, who is joining us from Zurich, Switzerland, a member of our Zurich FPNA board. Uh, Marat is Finance Director Europe at Supply Chain at Ecolab. And today, Marat, Marat is going to talk about scenario modeling in disrupted environment, but also from the point of view of extended planning and analysis. Marat, welcome. Welcome to the webinar. Are you on mute? Please Thank you, Larissa. Back. Happy to be here. Thank you, Marat. Uh, and the last panelist join us from Toronto, Canada, uh, where we just had our uh, FPNA board meetings around uh, two weeks ago. Uh, Pras Chatterjee, Senior Director at SAP. And Pras is going to talk about how technology affects time spent by FPNA. So Pras has a lot of experience on this and also attended and facilitated many of those webinars and FPNA board meetings. Pras, welcome. Welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Rosa, and glad to be here. Thank you so much. So, dear panelists, if you can switch off your cameras just for a moment, because I have uh, a few very, very general slides. So uh, information about FPNA Trends Group and international FPNA board. Uh, we have 27 chapters in 16 countries on four continents. We already restarted meetings and already had 12 meetings both in North America and Europe. And we will continue from September. But also we will open some uh, additional chapters, uh, four additional chapters by the end of the, uh, this year. Uh, a lot of resources available, but about this webinar. So please um, participate in the polling questions. There will be two of them. There will be interactive uh, Q&A session, and please uh, ask questions via the chat box. It's very easy to do. Presentation is available at the handouts, but also we will send you the recording and presentation after the meeting. So it's all general things. Now about our sponsor. So thank you so much to our technology sponsor, SAP, one of the world's leading providers of modern FPNA solution. Thank you for supporting us globally. Let's start. Let's move on. So let us start uh, from key findings. Um, I'm very excited to share with you those, some of them. There are obviously a lot of them. It's quite a comprehensive paper, everyone. So for the sixth time in a row, uh, we uh, had this uh, survey. We had opportunity to go deeper, to analyze this over the years, over the different groups. And today we are going to share with you the results. You can see that geography is quite, uh, uh, so quite wide. Uh, practically, we had participation from uh, many countries around the globe and continents as well. 
I would like I would like to start from some good news. Uh, we always talk about increased strategic value of FPNA. There is a proof of this. You can see that for the last three years, definitely the perception of strategic value of FPNA increased. Actually, 10% from year 2020 to year uh, 2022. 76% of people they agree or strongly agree that uh, the strategic value is there. This is great news. But when we look at, at the quality of time, how people, how FPNAs spend their time um, doing their job, uh, there are some good news here, but the reality is that uh, for the last four years, it's very, very static. You know, there are some improvements, but we can see that only 33% of time is spent on high value adding activity, uh, such as insight generation, driving action and 45% is still spent on low value adding activity, such as data collection, data validation. Why? Uh, it's very obvious when we look at this analysis and when we compare year previous year and this year. So only 23% of people say that they have excellent data quality. 34% stated that low or poor quality of data for their FPNA and it went down 4%, some improvements, but not so much. 31%, almost one third, they said that they do, do, do not have a single source of trusted data. But nevertheless, 56% of uh, all decisions in FPNA, they are based on data, but it's down by 10% for the last year. Why it's down? Uh, we think that it's because of the quality of data and also it's because of the high uncertainty when uh, the past data do not exactly uh, explain the future results. The quality of forecast, no surprise, it's also went down. The perception of good and great quality of forecast, incredible inc decrease. Uh, last year, it was 54% of people said that they're happy with their quality of forecast, only 39% this year. But then when we look at different groups of people, uh, those that are using driver-based planning or cloud technology or artificial intelligence machine learning, their satisfaction with the quality of forecast is increasing. Uh, you can see that half of cloud users, they are happy with the quality and amazingly 63% of AI ML users for FPNA, uh, they are quite happy with the quality. And another quick insight uh, on different kinds of groups, um, this is when we look at the real time data. We discuss this many times in this incredible environment. Uh, the access to real time data is uh, very, very important. So the average group, 46% uh, of people said they have access to real time data. 60% of cloud users and 81% of AI ML users. So, let us move on and uh, let us look in more details on those findings, but also practical insights on data-driven decision-making for FPNA. Uh, Thomas Landell, uh, I would like to invite you to join us. Please switch on your camera. Here I am. Hi, Thomas. Uh, once again, uh, Thomas Landell, Senior Director in EA GTM Finance, NetApp. And the subject is data-driven decision-making under uncertainty. Thomas, the, the floor is yours and you're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Larissa. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Yes, so Thomas Landell, uh, work for, for NetApp uh, out of the Netherlands. Uh, as you can see from the flag behind here, I'm originally from Sweden. Uh, so let me talk to you about data-driven decision-making under uncertainty. So as you can see on the on the sort of um, chart here. We we have uh, we're faced now with with unprecedented uncertainties in the markets. Right, we've had COVID for two years, which which created uncertainties. But coming out of that, when we all thought things were going to stabilize a little bit, we saw inflation rates uh, going through the roof, interest rates going through the roof. We had armed conflicts, the stock market uh, uh, turbulence. Um, we have shortages. We have supply chains that are are breaking down, and we have you know black swans everywhere, if you will. And, and that certainly has, has uh, made it a little bit more difficult to make uh, uh, decisions. And we, we, can, we can also see that actually in the FPNA survey results, uh, if you look at the decision, the number of decisions made based on data, 
And the answer on, on high number, all decision dropped actually from 66% to, to 56%. So we see that it's becoming increasingly difficult to, uh, to make uh, a data-driven decision when we're in these uncertain, uh, uncertain markets and uncertain environments. So uh, just to, to address a little bit of how we thought about that at NetApp was to, we did many things. I just want to highlight a couple of things that, that we changed in our processes to, to address this uncertainty. The, the first thing that we did was certainly to reduce the, the planning horizon. Of course, we have a three-year plan. We know what the direction is, the North Star of the company, if you will. But, but with this uncertain, uncertain market, uncertain conditions, we decided to move from an annual planning cycle to a, to a, to a six-month planning cycle. Of course, we do the quarter forecast and everything on top of that. But so we did a budget period of six months. And that also includes actually our commission plans. Our commission plan for our sales force and, and management and leadership also was reduced to, to six months. And that made it easier to set reasonable targets because if you shorten the time horizon, the, the data that you have at least um, uh, increases the, the possibility that, you, that your projection will be, will be accurate rather than if you're using longer uh, time horizons, of course. And not, another thing that we did with all these exchange rate movements, I mean, I'm working for a US-based company, so we saw the, the US euro uh, exchange rate move more than 10% here over the last uh, uh, six months. We, we implemented uh, exchange rate decision board so we can tackle those decisions in a more structured way and understand a, a more cross-functionally what the impact is to the overall business, both to finance, to sales, and to, to supply chain and costs. And, and another thing that we did was when we looked at our sales, we also moved away from a kind of a kind of static monthly forecasting process to more dynamic bi-weekly that we can every every two weeks actually rotate uh see what the project the, the full quarter outlook and, and see what the most recent market conditions have, have altered so um generally speaking if you look at your data and you look at it in terms of, of processes so if you look on the next slide what um, how you can address this um uh, data-driven decision-making on uncertainty it, is through addressing it in several steps, right? And, and I think the, the main difference between under normal circumstances, I'm looking here at, at the process of how we make investment allocation process decision, right, that NetApp, is to know your, your mission. Once you know your mission, you can use that as a foundation for how you, you make your, your decision. So, so our mission is, you know, NetApp is a global cloud-led data-centric software company. So I know that that's what we do. I know what our North Star is. I know what our three-year plan is. So I can use that when I, when I make my more data-driven decision under uncertainty. Uh, then, you know, we, we identify the data sources. And, and here also, again, we have external data sources represented by the globe here with, with the filers. And as well, we have internal data sources. External data sources for us would be IDC and Forrester and, and Bloomberg and others. But, but also, they are also faced with the same uncertainties as we are. So we have to take all the information with a little bit of grain of salt and use it. And then we have an abundance of, of internal data, like most companies do, from business intelligence, CRM, ERP, data lakes, and, and all sorts of things. So we are pretty good at identifying those data sources. And, and these uncertainties haven't really changed the data sources that, that we're using. They're pretty much the same, quite frankly. The, the, the second step here is to clean and organize that data. And that, 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 that um, that is, you also see that in the FBNA server results, actually. The, the quality of data has improved slightly. Uh, you look at, at the, some of the slides that Larissa showed that we went from, from poor data quality was 13, you know, 13% went down to seven. And, and, but, but if you look at the total numbers still, you know, poor and low is still 35, 40% of, of the day. And that's, that's, that's just very difficult to make decisions, particularly in uncertain times, where 35 to 40% of, of the, of the FPNA respondents think that the, the data quality is relatively poor. So we, we started at NetApp to, to invest much more time and, and, and energy to make sure that we, we, we clean the data and organize the data. And I think there's not enough focus here in generally, hasn't been at NetApp and maybe not other companies. This is not the most sexiest part of the job, perhaps, but it is very important because it helps with the next step as well, which when you need to analyze the data. And again, from the FPNA survey, we see that uh, only 20% of the time of FPNA is spent on insight generation, and almost 50% is, of the time is, is, is spent on data collection and data validation, which should, is more or less you know, cleaning and organizing your data. Uh, and, and here I kind of had a little undercover boss moment, if, if you will, where I said, well, that, that's just, that's, is that really true at Meta? And when you look at it and you talk to my FPNA teams, my FPNA director, yeah, it's probably true for us as well. 
So there's a tremendous opportunity for companies, I think, to, to invest in cleaning and organizing data and using software tools to do so, and perhaps artificial intelligence or bots or whatever. Uh, and lastly, on this uh, chart is the decision making, right? And um, at NetApp, you know, FPNA is actually making decisions. So we both are, you know, I view the FPNA department as both decision support in these uncertain times, using all this data to make sure that management does the right decisions. But also, what I try to do differently, and, and you know, trying to make us more data driven, is that that uh, FPNA department is actually making decisions on investment allocation because they know the best, they know the data. Perhaps not the biggest decisions. But you know, when it comes to you go down the scale of, of size of, of investments and importance of investment, I think that the FPNA department can make decisions as well. And and I sometimes tell my team that it's better to get a, a speeding ticket than a parking ticket, as, as they say, right? So in, in in summary, I think that in these uncertain times, if I look at what NetApp has done, uh, you know, you, you always have to know your mission uh, and and use that and, and and as your basis for your data-driven decision in these uncertain times. Secondly, that, that we did, and I would recommend other companies to do as well, is to adjust the planning horizons. Uh, you know, data-driven decisions are more reliable if you make the timing planning horizon shorter. And I would also really invest in, in automation and, and cleaning and organizing data and, and invest time there uh, in, 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 in tools and software and artificial intelligence, bots, whatever it is. And, and I realize that it's not the sexiest of, of the parts of this process, but it is one of the most important that will help your FBA team to spend more time on insight generation, analyzing data and making uh, decisions. So, yeah. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, thank you for your practical insights. Uh, this is the timing now for our audience uh, to take part in the polling question. I'm launching the polling question and uh, the main thing we would like to understand is what are the main barrier uh, in your way to data-driven decision-making process? Yeah, uh, I would like to ask you uh, to start voting. Please choose one of those that is the most important barrier in your view. Uh, so select one of the following options. Is it shortage of relevant skills? Is it a deficiency of proper analytical tools? Is it lack of leadership support or absence of data-driven culture? We know that data quality is one of those, the biggest ones, but please, if you can choose from those four that look at this uh, from a little bit different perspective. So please continue to vote. What is the main barrier on your way to data-driven decision-making? Shortage of skills? deficiency of tools, lack of leadership support, or absence of data-driven culture. I can see that uh, more than 60% of you voted just a few seconds. I'm closing the poll and I'm sharing the results with everyone. So um, as you can see, shortage of relevant skills, it's only 14%. The biggest one is deficiency of proper analytical tools. The next biggest one is absence of data-driven culture. Uh, then uh, it's lack of leadership support. Uh, Thomas, a uh, quick commentary from your side. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, uh, uh, of course, I think that there is a deficiency of proper analytical tools. And I think that uh, many companies are underinvested in this area as well. Uh, when I look at the answers also, uh, you know, shortage of relevant skills doesn't seem to be, be one, right? Um, but I think also there, if you look at yourself in the mirror uh, as an FBA department, or looking at my FBA department, are they really up to date on all of these new technologies, on bots, on AI, on machine learning, right? Do they have the right skills to do that as well to make the right data decision making? So, so uh, you know, I, I understand the results, but I would also, on top of going for the right tools and technology, look at yourselves if you have the relevant skills also in these in these times. Thank you so much for your commentary. I'm hiding the results. And let us move on. Um, I would like for us to have a very quick uh, mini discussion. So uh, I would like to invite the panelists to join me here to discuss the following important question. So as we all see, it's not only the quality of data. It's also the fact of changing business models, the fact that historical data may not fully reflect the future in this incredibly uncertain environment. So the question to the, uh, to the panel is, how do we address this issue in FPNA? 
So Thomas, what would be your um, key takeaways? Yeah, I think I think uh, you know you don't have future data, right? You have maybe data about the future. You're kind of always in the present, like Eckhart Tolle would say, probably. But uh, uh, I, I do think you need to look at at, uh, at scenarios, and I think we, when we spoke earlier with with uh, this team, also Pratt had some good ideas about you know Monte Carlo simulation and so forth. And when you when you're in these uncertain times, also you need to factor in or accommodate for different scenarios and play them out how will they be in the future. Great insights and definitely in order to place scenarios we need key drivers that are coming from analysis of data. Marat, what would be your uh, key takeaways? How you would answer this question? Yeah, thank you, Laris. And it's, it's, it's a great question. And uh, indeed, the, the, uh, the historical data isn't always a good predictor of the future. But that's one of the few tools from which we can learn. And I mean, well, uh, we, we all like to be database and uh, we learn from the data we have. But then what do we do with that? So I think that's important. And here I would agree with, with um, uh, Thomas and with others so that, uh, well, we, we, can, uh, we can learn by, by um, uh, we can take it forward basically by start making an assumption uh, for the future. And for this, we'll need to use business drivers, as you said. So what we know about business, what about uh, what we know about company we are working in, and uh, then starting to collect this all together so that we can move uh, using the tools, uh, scenario modeling, and so on. So and then further testing these assumptions with the more data coming in. So because again, we want to stay uh, database, I assume. Fantastic. Thank you, Marat. Uh, and I know that you are going to talk about this scenario management culture. Yeah. So, Pras, uh, what would be your uh, insights to answer this question? Yeah, I mean, um, if we look at the results of the poll, um, I, I think one of the results was that 45% feel that they don't have the right analytical tools. Well, let me make it very clear. The right analytical tools are there. All vendors in this space have analytical tools that help you analyze your historical data. And yes, it's true. It doesn't reflect. I mean, the last two years have shown that your historical data, for the most part, won't help you in this current environment. But if you marry historical data with your current assumptions and all the drivers that Thomas and Murat talked about and put them all together and basically throw in your own assumptions, uh, you don't have to do some sort of, um, you know, uh, past skew analysis or whatnot. You can do, as Thomas and I have talked about in the past, modern technology that enables Monte Carlo simulations and such that, that you know, looks at the randomness of such um, you know, um, uh, simulations and effectively, at the end of the day, gives you a forecast that you can really look at and identify possible trends with. Uh, Pras, thank you so much. Great insights. And we will hear more about this in your presentation later on. So let us move on. Uh, and this is the timing for us to look at scenario modeling and to look at uh, the concept of extended planning and analysis. And I would like to invite Marat uh, to join me. So Marat, uh, the time of your uh, presentation, your case study, uh, it's about scenario mo modeling in disrupted environment. So finance director, Europe supply chain, Ecolab, Marat Lamakov. Marat, you're welcome. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting an opportunity to, to speak here to, to this audience. So, and uh, what I'm going uh, to talk today uh, is um, about a couple of insights uh, I've seen from um, uh, the recent uh, FPNA trend survey, uh, which were striking me, and then how we're addressing this uh, in the company where I currently work in Ecolab. So, well, two points uh, which were quite um, uh, obvious to me that first of all, more than half of you are saying that you don't have um, XPNA implemented yet, and one third of you uh, don't even consider it. And about the scenario uh, playing, which is the second point, is uh, you're basically saying that nearly half of you are not able to provide scenarios at all, or it takes you for uh, longer than, than one week uh, to make it happen. So, which is actually uh, for me is the same like not making it work. So, since uh, the amount of the disruptions we see and the amount of changes we see in the current world is just enormous and uh, after a week a lot of things can be changed and i'll be talking about some of those disruption on the next slide and also linking back to what uh, thomas was saying so already before covid the supply chains uh, were disrupted uh, quite a bit with uh, different questions around climate geopolitics cyber security and uh, only when we're thinking that okay covid is now slowly slowly going away so there are new events uh, uh, happening in, in on europe continent so which um, actually amplified uh, the amount of stress and disruptions to supply chain quite a bit and recently natural gas um, uh, became one of the highest topics uh, for 
chemical industries since it serves not only as a, one of the key energy uh, sources but also as a feedstock for many produced uh, raw materials. This all brings not only the fear of the fuel and inflation but also simply questions the availability of certain materials in the market. So like, well, it's not about the price, it's about whether we are able to buy it or not. And uh, I'm going to share some examples um, of um, it, how we are addressing it um, uh, within, within our company. So, and uh, this, uh, this is basically how the XPNA is implemented and, and working at the moment here. So uh, on the next slide, I'm uh, going to talk about some the model which uh, we are using uh, here to, to facilitate the discussion, facilitate the calculations. So that's basically a model which is uh, going from the products which we are producing down to the raw materials which um, uh, we are buying from, from our vendors, but then also uh, following further down uh, the path uh, to understand what are the key commodities are actually impacting uh, those, uh, those raw materials so that uh, later on we can understand how specific uh, market movements can affect uh, the, the raw materials prices we are using as a feedstock for our applications. And we use this model broadly in XPNA application. So, and uh, it's stored uh, because it's, it contains quite a vast amount of data. It's stored, of course, in a cloud database where uh, some of the calculations are made. And then on the next slide, I'm going to talk how we are going, how we are using it in uh, in some of the analytics we are we are doing. So, like, well, um, one of the examples of um, uh, XPNA in action, so which um, I want to talk about, is uh, basically how we can go beyond the classical PNA and uh, not only look at uh, uh, financial data, which uh, I believe all of us uh, are analyzing on uh, pretty much uh, daily basis, such as uh, sales and margin for given product, categories, businesses. Uh, but here we can bring on top of this data also the information about what is happening with the supply of these um, uh, of raw materials impacting those products. Are they in shortage? Uh, what is the market situation around it? And uh, if there are certain uh, uh, capacity constraints or there is certain um, impacts uh, which would require a team to make an extra effort to bring these uh, raw materials um, in, into the company, so then uh, what are we going to do about it? And then by con connecting it uh, with uh, some of the information on the uh, margin and sales, we can say, well, if those SKUs, for example, are low sales uh, and also low margin, but on top, it, it requires uh, quite some effort uh, to even buy and find these materials. So what kind of like choices uh, uh, can we make? And uh, is it really a right uh, investment from the company perspective uh, to, go, to go this way? So, and it creates the whole set of uh, new questions and new potential decisions uh, to be made. But this is all a static um, view, so because we are here analyzing the historical view. Now, like, well, if we take it uh, forward, so, um, and uh, on the next, I uh, will be talking about some of the examples how we can um, start um, amending this model with, um, uh, for, for scenario planning. So that's uh, where it becomes uh, quite a powerful tool uh, for the future discussion. So, and um, uh, the, the key thing here is uh, how to start looking into the, um, uh, into the future and start anticipating, but not necessarily talking about what was happening in the past. So, and of course, because of the uh, quite a large amount of data uh, we are having here, so it's uh, very difficult to, to uh, start simulating everything altogether. So, and we decided to go with a couple of key commodities, uh, which basically market helped us to define, so to speak. So, which is natural gas and, and the oil. And uh, we started with definition of scenarios we want to uh, look into. So, i.e., what are the border conditions, so to speak? What are the prices we want to uh, understand out of these scenarios? And uh, we defined uh, certain data points here. So, okay, what would be the price to, to, to analyze? And uh, here, uh, the question to be asked uh, always is, uh, well, um, can it be possibly real? Because if it's completely out of reality, then uh, the whole trust into the model will be uh, broken later on. So, but at the same time, it also should bring some potential um, potential uh, outcomes um, uh, into the future so that uh, we can uh, stimulate uh, some, some fruitful conversations out of it. So once we define these, so then we can uh, see, okay, what are the materials actually affected by, by those feedstocks? So, and uh, we were looking at uh, two potential impacts. Uh, the one is a direct, so I, what are the materials directly impacted by oil or natural gas, but also like how the um, energy, which is indirect impact uh, and uh, energy is also sourced to quite a big extent from the natural gas here is uh, impacting the cost of these, uh, these materials. 
Once this is all done, so like we calculated uh, uh, some of the core parameters in our cloud database. However, unfortunately, it's not that flexible. So the finishing we had to do in, in Excel. So that's where um, our old good Excel is still a kind of like a powerful tool um, uh, to make some, uh, to give us some more flexibility into analytics we are doing. And once it is there, so we can have a look at the range of potential outcomes. And what is important also to break it down by the different um, uh, businesses so that we can have appointed conversations with them. After all of this, we're having the management conversation, of course, and that's where the action discussions and different decisions are um, made. So it seems to be quite uh, straightforward and smooth on this slide. Uh, however, the road is, of course, uh, bumpy. And on the next slide, I'm going to share with you some of the advices or some of the experiences which uh, were helping us uh, to, to uh, overcome some of the barriers here. So, and of course, that's also how we look in the future for potential other implementation of, of, of those cases. So, uh, first of all, uh, we need to anticipate the impact uh, using the business acumen, knowing the business drivers which are affecting our business. Um, and uh, that's basically um, means that we need to stay in connection to the reality where we are in because if uh, finance people are suddenly coming and starting to talk about some nonsense, so like um, no of the business leaders will be accepting any of our recommendation. Well, we know that our data is not accurate and that's um, uh, not always accurate and not always precise. And that's what I'm talking about, point number two. And sometimes we need to make uh, compromises um, uh, in between uh, how quick we can provide certain scenarios and um, uh, what is what is the accuracy of this. And here I'm not uh, encouraging anyone to compromise on the quality, but rather um, avoiding to get to 100% perfection by spending weeks and weeks and weeks on um, those scenario modeling, because by that point of time, you can realize that uh, uh, these, these scenarios are already not uh, even uh, needed anymore. And finally, uh, a couple of more points on the how to improve the robustness and uh, quality of this model. So with the new dat data coming in, so test your model, uh, make it credible, review the assumption, um, and um, uh, get um, um, uh, show that it's, it can be uh, trusted further. So, and uh, of course, if the new factors are coming in um, into the model, so then uh, keep keep updating it. So, like stay in touch with the reality, as I said in the very beginning. So, and uh, this will define your your success on this path. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And uh, now I'm curious to learn more about uh, your experiences um, in this journey. Marat, thank you so much for sharing with us your practical insights. And the next polling question, uh, it would be around uh, scenario management, scenario planning. We would like to understand what is the best description of scenario planning in your company. I'm launching the poll. Uh, and please, uh, can you start voting as soon as you see the question? How would you describe your current FPNA scenario planning process? Is it non-existent? Is it very traditional? For example, worst, best, average cases? Or you are having scenarios, but they are very time consuming, or your scenario planning is really best in class, and you do this in real time. Uh, please, can you continue vote? Uh, I can see that uh, more than half of you voted. Once again, what is the best description of your scenario planning? Non-existent, traditional, um, real time consuming or it's really a best in class real time please continue to vote uh, more than 60 percent now i'm closing the poll i'm sharing the results with everyone uh, and let us see so almost 50 percent of you say that it's very traditional three way scenarios was best than average um, 30 percent use scenarios but it's very very time consuming 15% uh, non-existent and 6% already in best-in-class scenario planning process. Marat, any any surprises for you? Any commentaries, please? Yeah, thank you, Larissa. A couple of comments here. It's uh, quite interesting uh, results, um, and actually, it looks like they're a little bit better than what the uh, survey was was showing. So, and I'm I'm happy about this because only 15% are saying that scenarios are are not not existing so like and uh, yeah the, the the majority is is doing some sort of scenario planning and uh, i must say i'm um, i envy a little bit to the people who uh, who belong to the six percent and who voted that their scenario playing is a real time because uh, that's uh, that's really something which um, uh, i think we all need to aspire for so and we need to go for in the future 
Uh, thank you for your commentaries. I'm hiding the results. And uh, this is the time for a very quick uh, mini discussion. I would like to ask everyone to join me, please. Uh, Marat, uh, Thomas, Pras, please, can you join us? So uh, a very quick discussion about a scenario management mindset. Uh, we had those 12 meetings in Europe and also in the US uh, about lessons learned. Scenario management, it's one of the biggest uh, processes that needed at the moment, yeah? And everyone agrees that it's a mindset, it's not just a process. So in your view, what are the key success factors for implementation of this scenario management mindset in organization? Uh, I would like to ask you, Thomas, you are the first, very quick uh, insights, please. Yes, so for us, I think the key success factors for its implementation is, is I mean, it goes goes with almost without saying in, in terms of mindset is to get the, the, the business and the stakeholder buy into this so that you're building the right relationship with the business and that they understand uh, how this scenario management works. And that is not just, you know, gut feeling and, and uh, management going by intuition, but that it really is, you know, data driven scenario management. Uh, so, so having that stakeholder engagement is key. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Marat? Yeah, and I'd like this statement about the mindset because it's really all about the mindset. Um, and, uh, you know, the scenarios, so as we discussed, it's all about the uh, future and we need to look there. And uh, uh, sometimes I see that, especially in the finance function, we like to uh, look in the past and reconcile the data and explain every last um, uh, dollar. But that's again, that's about past and uh, how to turn from this uh, past looking into the more forward looking so that's uh, for me about this mindset so going away from reconciliation of the past into the definition of the future anticipating the impacts and starting modeling this and discussing how can this um, add value into uh, from what we do here thank you so much Mara. thank you pras your insights uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Larissa, I think one of our colleagues in the New York board uh, called it crisis management, which really makes sense, especially in this day and age. Um, I think for finance to really embrace scenario management as part of its implementation, it's the mindset. And the mindset means that you know, you've got to stop thinking about planning, budgeting, forecasting on a scheduled basis where you start your budgets at an X time, you do the forecast at the start of the month, you do business updates, and really it's, it's almost like a form of continuous planning continuous planning and managed scenarios in that sense so that when crises do occur, when opportunities arise, you're able to address them immediately. And that's really the key success. The fact that you've changed the way your focus is and rather it's a mindset effectively. You are in full crisis and scenario management. Absolutely. And it's amazing to see that uh, so many companies, they're still not ready for changing and still very, very traditional. Uh, thank you so much for your commentaries. Let us move on. And now let us look at the technology and uh, the insights from the survey, how technology can change it. Uh, Pras, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, everyone, uh, Pras Chatterjee is senior director uh, at SAP. And the subject of the presentation is how technology affects the time spent by FPNA. Pras, uh, the stage is yours. Great, thank you, Larissa. And uh, thank you, everyone. So let's move on. Um, in the survey, there were some interesting highlights that many of you contributed to that I want to share. Um, obviously, some of the key ones for me were the fact that 63% uh, mentioned that AI and ML are driving more accurate forecasting for those that are using AI and ML. And as the technology progresses and gets stronger, I think this answer will get higher and higher as well. One thing that we've seen through the survey and as well uh, through our board meetings in London, Europe, and in North America is that analytics and data analysis is really the most sought after skill in the FPNA profession. And many of you also said that data um, um, uh, 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 decisions based on data were you know, at, at the 57% level. So again, these are all really promising signs that will continue to get better. But let's talk about some of the things that came out of the survey that I think we can improve on as a team. Only 39% of you are satisfied with the quality of your forecast, which is effectively unacceptable. And that can be due to technology, that can be due to process or whatnot. Only 21% of you that participated in the survey, and again, there are over 375 to 400 participants, were, are able to fork, uh, produce a forecast in less than two days, which in this uh, current climate with different scenarios, crises, and opportunities and threats that are occurring is highly alarming. And 54% of you mentioned the running scenarios is a long and challenging process. So what can we do to improve this? 
So let's move on. Technology can support this with a key different technology uh, uh, areas that I'll address. AI and machine learning, having a cohesive data management strategy, adopting scenario management, and finally wrapping all this together with extended planning and analysis. So let's move on. Now, those of you that use AI and machine learning in your data deci in uh, decision making mentioned that 68% um, of you use it in a high number of your decisions, and which means that those of you that have AI and machine learning are really embracing it. And those that have it that haven't aren't using it, I'm sure this number will get uh, better and better because as they get new to this sort of technology that is very accessible and easy, their lives will get easier and they'll use it for more and more and maybe eventually most decisions. So let's move on. How do we use and embrace AI and machine learning? Well, we think of AI and machine learning as an ally to our plans. It's not meant to replace our plans. It's not meant to or con, or on, um, in a uh, distant manner or whatnot. It is an ally. It's a peer that give us, gives us insights based on historical trends or current probabilities. And I mentioned that because in the past, um, AI and machine learning was often based on looking at your historical trends, your historical data, and then running assumptions based on that. And we know now that historical trends in this current economy, in this current climate, probably isn't the best indicator of what's gonna happen in the future. But if we put in our own assumptions, we embrace all the data we have, uh, all the uh, drivers we have as part of our AI and machine learning trends um, and run Monte Carlo simulations and such, um, and really uh, look at the current probabilities, what it ultimately does is give us better business insights that lets us make better decisions. So let's move on. Now, when it comes to time spent on high value added activities, uh, depending on the technology implemented, um, most people that were effectively using AI and machine learning, uh, 24, there was a 9% increase uh, in driving actions. The average is 15%, but those organizations that were using modern technologies with, and really found that they were using better, uh, driving more actions and gaining more insights overall. So again, this is an improvement. This means that those organizations using modern technologies, whether it's AI, machine learning, cloud-based planning tools, or driver-based solutions uh, that embrace data, are getting, generating more insights and driving actions. So how do we accomplish this? Let's move on. Data management. The key thing here is to have one source for all of your trusted data. And what this means is that effectively having a cohesive ERP or HRIS or CRM or uh, supply chain, all of those uh, applications completely integrated as with your planning tool or have your planning tool as part of that. Why? because then you have one source for all of your trusted data. How many times have we as planners gone to present budgets, forecasts, and data has come up as an issue? There's a lot, and once there's a lack of faith in the data, there's a lack of trust in the data. And by bringing all of your, uh, having a cohesive data management strategy, or you effectively have, um, as I mentioned, a singular data where uh, ERP, a CRM, and a planning tool built on top of that, that is cohesive in manner that it shares one source of data, you have more trust in the data. If you don't have that available, it's still easy. You can have a single data warehouse or a data warehouse cloud where you bring all of your data in uh, from your different sources and then effectively have a planning tool based on that. So you're still working off the same data set. And what having a cohesive data set, uh, strategy such as this lets you bring in not just your financial data, but also your operational data, such as your HR metrics, your supply chain, your CRM. It lets you manage all of that data and lets you manage that data in a sense that you're able to deliver critical and time-sensitive information to your business constituents and your business audience. Let's move on. Now, the time taken to run scenarios. We've gone over this with Larissa and our other participants, but the fact that 26% of you indicated that you're not able to run scenarios and only 6% are able to run scenarios in real times in this current climate is unfathomable and really a disservice to our business constituents that depend on us, the lines of businesses or the products we support or our shareholders. So how do we improve this? It's by effectively adopting a scenario management strategy. Modern cloud-based planning tools have at the click of a button, the ability for you as business users to simulate outcomes, uh, basically make your own assumptions and simulate outcomes in a small condensed group. 
and then move away from scheduled plans. As I mentioned before, when we were addressing the polling questions and that discussion survey, it's not about doing budgets at a scheduled time, forecasts at a scheduled time. It's about thinking ahead and thinking forward and really modeling scenarios with planning and analytics together. So the key is once you have scenarios modeled, simulated, scenarios simulated, use analytics on top of that to share those scenarios with everyone and all those people that depend on you. Move away from Excel. Use dashboards and visualizations to make your point clear. So let's move on. Now, how do we bring this all together? We bring this all together through an XP&A, Extended Planning Analysis Strategy. XP&A is effectively bringing all of your planning, whether it's financial planning, operational planning, such as HR, uh, sales, uh, an SNLP process, a marketing planning, all together in a seamless strategic environment. And the key here for adopting XPNA is that it's for FPNA, those of you on this call right now, to raise awareness, to raise the need for this to your uh, C uh, CFOs who communicate this across the board, across the organization. And having a cohesive planning strategy means that you as FPNA are the leaders, leaders in planning across organizations. And by having all of your planning connected in a real time manner, which I promise you technology does in today's day and age, that's the easy part. The technology is the easy part. It's really the process that gives us challenges, but the process can also be defined and really help drive more agile and decisions with planning and anal analytics. And having all the plans connected allows you to plan with confidence on trusted data. So thank you very much and let's move on. Thank you so much, Pras. Great insights about the technology and how technology can improve the value in fp and &A. Uh, and we have uh, the next mini discussion. I would like to ask everyone to join us. Uh, it's all about uh, the trends in adoption of AI ML in FPA. Um, we started artificial intelligence machine learning FPA committee three and a half years ago at FPA Trends Group. And we look at different case studies, and definitely we see some uh, fantastic results. Uh, we can see from the survey that AI ML improving results significantly. So my question to you, how trends in adoption of this technology are going to influence the way how we plan in the future? Uh, Thomas, you are the first. I'm the first again. Yes, so uh, I, so the, I think the main change is, is that the AI and ML will help the company to make more, we talked about it before, and I'm repeating myself perhaps, data-driven decisions and, and not political or, or biased decision, right? It's almost about this thinking fast and slow uh, kind of decision. It will, will force, make companies, will give them greater ability to make really truly rational data-driven decisions that are, you know, removing the emotions uh, out of the decision-making process. Thank you, Thomas. Great insights. Marat? Yeah, and building up actually on, on, on this, um, uh, what I can say, and uh, okay, as much as I don't have a crystal ball to say uh, how it will be uh, playing the role in the future, but it definitely will be playing bigger and bigger role because, well, already by now we are, we are accumulating quite a lot of um, uh, different data, not always consistent, not always perfect, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot. And uh, first we are struggling quite often to analyze this data and that's where uh, these tools can help us but then also uh, start using this data uh, for further predictions. So that's uh, where for sure the adoption of this tool will help us. Thank you so much, Marat. And Pras, your insights, please. Look, I think the key thing for me is that cloud-based modern planning solutions, all of them, regardless of what vendor, they have AI and machine built directly into the solution. So now it's a matter of adopting it, using it, and leveraging as part of your decision-making process. And I think we saw in one of the survey results that um, one of the key trends that people think in terms of skills that are required for FP&A, and Larissa, you and I saw this in many board meetings, is understanding data. Uh, not having data scientists per, per se, but having data analysts that can help FP&A absorb and use all that information to understand the data and really help you know, deploy an AI and a machine learning strategy as part of your overall planning and analysis strategy. And maybe we start moving away from the planning and more on the analysis in the FP&A world. Absolutely, Pras, especially if we look at the survey results right now that 58% of people use predominantly Excel for the planning. And uh, there was an increase by 4% since last year. And we all understand why, because of the uncertainty, because of the inflexibility of maybe old solutions. And only 19% of uh, our respondents, they use uh, cloud technology. 
slight increase of 8%, not too bad. It was 11 last year, but it's still not enough. So a lot of things to do. Let us move on. And this is the time for key takeaways uh, before we go to the Q&A session. Uh, I would like to remind everyone, please continue to send your questions to us. Even if we don't have enough time to answer all of them, they would be answered in email. So please, uh, we are about to start Q&A session. So very quick 30 seconds key takeaways from this session. Thomas, your 30 seconds, please. That still almost 50% of the time we spent on data collection, and data validation. That was a surprise to me. Like I call it an undercover boss moment, right? I think that that's uh, that's something that uh, that we have to realize and we have to address as, as finance executives. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Marat, your key takeaways? Yeah, what I would say is that uh, data is important, but even more important what what we do um, in the end with with this data and how we start not only looking in the past but also looking in the forward with this this data and how the modern tools can help us on this way. Yes, thank you so much, Pras. Your key takeaway: thirty seconds. Yes. Uh, so my key takeaway is that you know there's clearly a lot of appetite and there's still room for organizations to adopt modern technologies to help the planning and analysis process. And uh, the key thing for me to uh, indicate to the, our audience is that it's not scary. It's actually really easy. Um, all vendors have the ability for you as FP&A to do, you know, devise a quick return on investment to quickly try our planning solutions in for a couple of months and see if it derives value for you. So it's in your hands. It's easy. Technology is part of the solution. It's not a problem and it's easy to deploy. Thank you. Thank you for those insights. Uh, this is the time for Q&A. Uh, I can see that uh, questions are coming. And the first one is uh, for you, Thomas. You are mm -hmm. the first one. So how long does it take to clean the data and to, to improve the data management process from your experience, Thomas? Uh, it's, an, it's a never ending uh, story, right? I don't think you'll ever get to, uh, to, uh, to a, a perfect result. Uh, I think that, uh, and, and particularly for us, because we're very, you know, I work in the business finance and sales finance. So customer data master or customer uh, is very important to us. And, and, you know, things happen with mergers and acquisitions all the time. So just as, simple as that means that our, our customer master changes all the time uh, you know you know and, and spin-offs happen and, and how do we address uh, subsidiaries of companies right uh, who's our new customer and, and so things things like that so so it's it's, it's ever evolving for sure thank you thomas uh, marat uh, the next question is to you uh, you were talking about extended planning and analysis you were talking about a supply chain in particular so are there any other aspects of extended planning and analysis, xp &A in your company? Any other examples how fp &A people are leading this new move of uh, xp &A? Not move, Not new, but uh, it's definitely called xp &A now. Marat? Yes. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. So and and frankly, it's also a little bit about the uh, the culture and uh, what is the role of the finance and uh, is the finance as a kind of like uh, number keepers or they're really like a trusted business partners or uh, co-pilots uh, within the company and um, uh, we, we are actually more on the uh, second part so across um, all of the functions uh, which which i've seen so far um, and basically the finance are going beyond uh, just uh, the numbers uh, what what we are reporting what we are seeing into more into understanding what the business is doing how the business is doing and in my experience as well when i was a, a business unit controller or divisional controller i was also traveling to see the customers to meet the customers to understand how the salespeople are selling our products and so on and that that was um, quite uh, a great um, experience which is uh, helping later on basically to to connect uh, the dots and uh, make the numbers not just something what you see in front of you on the spreadsheet but uh, uh, make it uh, uh, understandable from the perspective what do, what do they mean from the business perspective thank you thank you marat uh pras uh, you are the next uh the question is about investment in systems how we can convince our top management that this is the timing to invest and also how we can make sure that we invest in the right technology because they're changing so quickly. Absolutely. So um, I think the key thing for you is um, to really um, do a return on investment. I mean, I think all vendors these days allow uh, organizations and users such as yourself to, uh, you know, 
play around with their tools. They have value calculators that let you plug in your data and then have outputs such as, you know, if you set, if you spend X amount of time on reports, X amount of time generating insights, uh, what the average based on the vendors do for you. The other thing is that uh, because all the modern technology now is cloud-based, it's really easy. It's effectively OpEx. It's a monthly subscription. You don't have to set up a hardware. You don't have to buy servers. You don't have to uh, deploy. I mean, effectively, modern cloud-based planning solutions, I mean, and I'm not even speaking on behalf of myself. I'm speaking on behalf of all vendors, have easy access to um, business content that lets you do uh, effectively, you know, change some uh, account hierarchies, change some dimensions, and let you try it out. Try it out for three months. See if it adds value. Um, and once you do that, you'll have a better sense of the return on investment, which makes you helps you make your business case. At the end of the day, it's about moving away from Excel. I mean, if you're if you look at the survey and you see where you stand with regards to survey, if you're in the half of companies that can't generate insights immediately, there's a problem, and that's a problem to your management, and that's a problem to your shareholders. Thank you, Pras. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is to all of you. Uh, it's about uh, the new roles in FPNA group. So uh, we were talking about FPNA data scientists. Um, how to find the bridge between uh, these two professions, FPNA and data science? Definitely, we need them. Uh, but how we can make sure that they are talking to each other and understand each other? What is your experience, everyone? Thomas? Yeah, so so it's a very good question. It is uh, so we we've we've struggled with that a little bit, quite frankly, because we we've tried to attract data scientists into the you know FPNA and finance profession, and and it, it, we've had some experience with that data scientists don't really want to join finance, so so because they want to go the you know the data scientist route altogether. But so so but I do think that the the finance teams and 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 myself and our team have to learn to to attract data scientists that don't just work with debit and credit and have that traditional, you know, big four background, but really uh, business intelligence and data scientist background is, is definitely the new type of FPNA breed that we need. Thank you, Thomas. Great answer. Marat? Yeah, and actually I can only concur this and um, I was reading there probably a week ago, the one of the reviews from of the, one of the hiring agencies who, who, is, who is helping us and uh, they were seeing it also as a trend on the market that uh, now the requirements to see any kind of like experience with the data beyond Excel is extremely valuable nowadays. So, and uh, yeah, probably it won't be a function of uh, finance and data scientists in the same team, but uh, there will be a certain balance between the, um, uh, in terms of the skill set. So like, well, that we will see more and more the skill set of uh, some of the skills of data scientists required for uh, finance professionals in comparison to what we see in the past. Uh, thank you, Mara. Thank you for your answer. Pras, your experience. So, yeah, so Larissa, I think you and I have talked about this, but maybe it's not so much as needing a data scientist because at the end of the day, modern tools have AI and machine learning built into it. We're not asking our FPNA professionals to all of a sudden learn Python. Maybe what we need is a data architect uh, or a data strategy person that can and help FPNA embrace the data, bring the data together. And it's about finance now changing their mindset from you know, reporting on what's happened in the past to using the data and the data architects, what the strategy they've set up to report on what's about to happen and what's going to happen in the future. So maybe a data architect is something that we look at as well. Absolutely, I would say both are very, very important. Yeah. And my experience is that I can see more and more finance professionals receiving the second education, you know, like uh, they're graduating from university with master of science in artificial intelligence. So definitely it's a good idea to look, to be multidisciplinary, to understand both worlds, to be the bridge between those worlds. I think this is the future, but definitely data architect. Uh, it's another uh, very, very um, important profession in FPNA, the role. Um, there are more questions, uh, but we don't have time to answer all of them. But no, don't mind because we will send you the answers after this meeting. Uh, we are not going to uh, lose any of those questions. So thank you for sending them. Uh, let us move on. Uh, just a few updates uh, before we finish this webinar, but please stay with us. So some of our upcoming meetings, we're already planning uh, the next webinars uh, in uh, September, 15th of September. It's about maturity model, how to achieve intelligent transformation. And then uh, on the 21st of September, we are talking once again 
and exclusively about scenario management. A lot of insights we gathered uh, from those meetings around the globe. So if you would like, uh, the registration process is ongoing now. Once again, I would like to remind everyone, very fresh paper, lots of insights, um, a lot of analysis over there. So please download. The link is here. We will send this to you as well. Uh, and before we say uh, goodbye, uh, I, would, I would like to say thank you so much to our sponsor, SAP. Thank you so much for supporting us. Uh, I would like to say thank you so much to all our participants. Please stay with us. Uh, you will find a way how to connect. We have a lot of resources for you. And finally, uh, I would like to say thank you so much to our fantastic international panel, uh, Thomas, Marat, Pras. Such a privilege to collaborate with you. Looking forward to our next meeting. Uh, and uh, let us uh, continue to collaborate with our whole community. And of course, uh, uh, many thanks to uh, our Ukrainian team, uh, Ukrainian team that is helping Kafena Trans Group with all admin work. Thank you so much and glory to Ukraine. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, speak very, very soon. All the best. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.